بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم <تصفيق> الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام الأتمان الأكملان على خير خلق الله أجمعين نبينا محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وعلى آله وصحبه ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين وسلم تسليما كثيرا أما بعد All praise due to Allah We praise them abundantly And we ask Allah to exalt the mention and grant peace And send his salutations and his blessings upon the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Upon his companions, his wives and all those who follow them on their path of righteousness Until the day of recompense I know it's quite confusing when the speaker's on here And then there's a screen there Where do you look? Or do you look on both just in case you miss something over there You can see it here I don't know, I would be confused if I were you um, choose whichever one is most appropriate Now, so he asks you a, a trick question And you fell for it But then again Is that really a trick question or, or is it a, a crime To be watching the World Cup, right? That's the, the thing, I think the most controversial topic we can discuss And believe it or not, it is part of our discussion uh, because it does coincide with Ramadan And ironically for me specifically It coincided with my lecture So my lecture was at the time of the final game And so you can imagine uh, What a tough choice it would be Do I go to a lecture about Islam Or if you're German I watch Germany squash you know, Argentina Or the other way around Of course people made a choice Some came to the lecture some watch the game. I'm not mad. No one is mad. It's the qadr of Allah. And we don't know where goodness is. Of course, we assume that goodness is in a lecture. But still, the issue of the World Cup or the issue of the uh, many distracting um, activities that take, you know, that take place in Ramadan on yearly basis has become an issue for us. So much so that uh, Ramadan has not has become something else. The 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 name, the word, the uh, the way we spend our time, it's almost like exactly the opposite of the objective of Ramadan. It's a paradox. It's a paradox. Ramadan. We hear in the Quran, شهر رمضان الذي أنزل فيه القرآن هدى للناس that in the month of Ramadan the Quran was revealed, and now video games on smartphones and tablets is almost or predominantly the only thing that the people be doing during the fasting and after the fasting and before Taraweeh and after Taraweeh. And during suhoor and before suhoor and after suhoor is like, whoa! Well, it's an innocent game. I'm only, you know, bursting bubbles or running away from something. I don't know, I've seen all types of games that the kids be playing. And so uh, the Quran finds no space, no time. Illa man rahim Allah. Now this is not generalizing or saying that this is the case with every individual. But at a large scale, this is one of the issues we are facing. Uh, the month of Ramadan is supposed to be the month of fasting. But we find out that in the month of Ramadan we are eating. And I was uh, with the brother, you know, and he's driving me somewhere. I'm not going to mention the company so we won't be misusing the microphone here. But it said something about extreme Ramadan meal. And it had like this, all this food in this one image. Like more than you can eat, technically. And so, you know, it's like, really? Like, isn't this like Ramadan and supposed to be fasting and everything? And yes, we're going to break our fast. But what is all this with the food advertisement in the month of fasting? Then of course we can switch to a completely different world, the television world. And the many uh, dedicated channels, I must say, that go out of their way to put together for us 
the most fantastic not uh, you know soap operas specifically with 30 episodes for the month of Ramadan and of course what are the what is the content of these uh, soap operas don't ask because I'm not gonna tell you because I don't know but we can tell according to the reviews and according to the uh, glimpses here and there and according to the previews that it is nothing that has to do with getting close to Allah or following the sunnah of the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam so we become like a you know a victim we're victimized in a sense that we're being bombarded with all kinds of distractions and we're trying to hang in there for as long as possible to utilize the month of Ramadan but time is slipping away how many days have gone already? 15, 16, right? Khalas. Close an eye and open it once again and you'll be saying, uh, you know, كُلُّ عَامٌ وَأَنْتُمْ بِخَيْرُ وَتَقَبَّلُ اللَّهُ مِنَّا مِنْكُمْ or whatever the people say nowadays as means of greeting each other for Eid. But we don't want that to happen. We do not want this to happen again. Because we probably have done this in more than one Ramadan. Where we said, oh this Ramadan I didn't really get it right. So next Ramadan inshallah I'm going to have a plan. And I'm going to finish the Quran four times. And I'm not going to do any of that stuff. And blah blah blah. And sure enough Ramadan begins and we're like, hey this is worse than last year. This is not turning out very good. Well there are many reasons behind that. The most important of which is not really knowing the value of Ramadan. Yes, we have heard it in tens of lectures. Tens of lectures. And every speaker and every da'i and every shaykh and every student of knowledge will explain to the people that, you know, uh, the month of Ramadan is such and such will happen. And some say the deeds will be multiplied. There's no real evidence for that, that the deeds will be multiplied. Uh, of course, we have utaqa. Uh, and this is according to the authentic tradition of the Prophet ﷺ, which was authenticated by Shaykh Al-Albani. That لِلَّهِ عُتَقَاءٌ مِنَ النَّارِ وَذَلِكَ فِي كُلِّ لَيْلَ Every night of the nights of Ramadan, Allah will redeem certain people from the fire. Redeem mean, it means they will never enter the fire. They will be protected from ever being admitted to the hellfire. How many Muslims exist all over the world? Allahu A'lam. I don't know what the latest statistics say. Nevertheless, every night, a number of them will be redeemed by Allah so that they will not enter the fire. Are we among them? Have we at least achieved that goal on one of those nights of the nights of Ramadan? We know about the last 10 nights of Ramadan. We know about I'tikaf. I'm not going to repeat that. We know about Laylatul Qadr and that it is خَيْرٌ مِنْ أَلْفِ شَهْرٌ Usually we say it's equivalent to the worship of 83 years and 4 months or something, right? Which is what a thousand months is. But actually the ayah says خَيْرٌ مِنْ أَلْفِ شَهْرٌ It is better than that. It is better than that. So one night of ibadah, one night of ibadah would be more than worshipping Allah for 83 years. Which one of us will even live to see 83 years? or to experience in his life 83 years on this earth. Many won't. Many won't. Minority reach the age of 80. Most people go out before that. One night of the nights of Ramadan. Are we going to spend it playing games? Are we going to spend it watching TV? Or are we going to spend it eating our hearts out? You know, from the time they break the fast until the Adhan of Fajr. Eat, 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 eat. Now sometimes you have a lovely mother who wants you to eat. In which case, do you eat or you don't eat? You eat? Are you sure? If your mother said eat, do you eat or you say, sorry mom, I ate too much? Are you guys sleeping? I know, look, it's a tough thing to give a lecture while fasting. I was like, where am I? 
Shouldn't I be sleeping in bed now? I'm supposed to sleep till two minutes before the adhan. What made me come to this lecture? Well, it's okay. It happens to the best people. Sometimes you have to hear a lecture while you're fasting. But doesn't mean you can't answer the speaker. Do you eat or do you not eat? What happened? Someone gave us a, a philosophical answer. Yes, sir? You don't eat? Oh. Your mother tells you to eat, you better eat. Now you can negotiate. Diplomatically. You know, mom, please, I'm trying to maintain a certain weight. Uh, I don't want to spend the rest of the next two hours in the bathroom. Uh, sometimes I vomit when I overeat. You can negotiate why you don't want to eat. But if your mother told you to eat, you better eat. The bottom line is, if you don't have such a mother, then you shouldn't be eating from the time you break your fast until Fajr. It's a one, you know, long iftar or iftar merged with suhoor. So like four hours for this one, four hours for that one. It's just one big meal. And we spoke last night about the amount of food that people consume that we will discuss later on in the lecture. But there's one hadith of the Prophet ﷺ I want to uh, quote right now, just to remind us about what exactly we are experiencing right now. Where are you? And, and what are you missing out on if we are missing out on Ramadan? The Prophet ﷺ in the hadith is in Tirmidhi, Tirmidhi ibn Majah ibn Khuzayma. It says, إِذَا كَانَ أَوْ لَيْلَ فِي شَهْرِ رمضان صُفِّدَتْ الشَّيَاطِينَ وَمَرَدَتِ الْجِنَّ If it is the first night from the nights of Ramadan, then all of the devils and the mighty ones among the jinn will be chained. Now of course the scholars explain this in so many different ways. Does that mean that there will be absolutely no evil uh, taking place or committed during the month of Ramadan? No, that is not the, that is not the case. Facts prove otherwise. It means that some of the scholars say that the strong ones among the shayateen will be chained while other shayateen continue to do their job. And some say the fact that they're chained does not mean that they are incapable. Like when you chain a dog. If you were to tie a dog to a tree, he cannot chase you, but if you go to him, can he bite you? Sure, if you go close enough, that chain does not prevent him from being able to do things. However, it will limit his range. And similarly, the shayateen will not have as much access, but if people go to the shayateen, the shayateen are there. And we have an nafsul ammara tu bisu, that, that, that uh, mentality within us that commands us to do evil. When that interacts with the shayateen, then evil does take place while people are fasting. And I was amazed, amazed at, uh, uh, piece of news that I read that uh, a person in Mecca okay was making wudu this is a, a person doing Umrah huh? he came to the Haram to perform Umrah and he was making wudu in the drinking water dispenser in a hotel okay you know they have the water dispensers now you don't make wudu there that's why they have bathrooms. He was making wudu there, and the employee of the hotel asked him to stop. You know what happened? He went, got a knife, and stabbed him to death. And I, I'm sitting there like, you know, the, the reaction you had, I'm reading this like, is this real? Do you really come all the way from X country to the Haram to worship Allah? And then you make wudu with drinking water dispenser and then when someone tells you not to do it, you stab him to death? For Allah's sake, is this something that a rational Muslim will do? Absolutely not. So where's, where, how can a person commit such a sin with all these shayateen working? That's because we also have a nafs al-ammara bisu, which we have to discipline and control. Otherwise, we would be deceived. Oh, there's no shayateen, I'm going to be an angel in, in Ramadan. No, no way. No way. People still fall into sin. وَغُلِّقَتْ أَبْوَابُ النَّارِ فَلَمْ يُفْتَحْ مِنْهَا بَابِ All of the gates of the hellfire will be closed, not even one will be open. 
وفتحت أبواب الجنة فلم يغلق منها باب. And then all of the gates of Jannah will be open. None of them will be closed. How many gates of Jannah do we have? Seven or eight? Eight gates of Jannah and seven gates of Jahannam or Iyadu Billah. صح. One of the gates is called باب الريان for the fasting Muslims, for the fasting people. The scholars say that does not mean that you have to fast voluntarily on Mondays and Thursdays or the three ayamul bir of each month. In fact, every Muslim who fasts the month of Ramadan is entitled to enter from Bab al-Rayyan for having fasted in Ramadan. So this is a privilege and a blessing from Allah Azza wa Jal. وَيُنَادِي مُنَادِي يَا بَاغِيَ الْخَيْرِ أَقْبِلْ وَيَا بَاغِيَ الشَّرِ Akusir, and then a caller calls out saying, Oh, seeker of good, come. This is the time. The month of Ramadan is the time. And oh, seeker of evil, desist, stop. This is a very relevant reminder to us. As you sit here, I am assuming, and I should assume, that each and every one of us is seeking good. Is anyone here seeking evil for the caller to say to him, stop? No, inshallah. We all here want good. We have a caller calling us to move forward, to come close. So what is hindering our path? And what are we waiting for? وَلِلَّهِ عُتَقَى مِنَ النَّارِ وَذَلِكَ كُلْ لَيْلَ As I mentioned, the reason why I quoted this hadith. And Allah Azza wa Jal will redeem certain people from the hellfire every single night. Every single night. So when you pray taraweeh, we are divided into at least four categories of people. The first category is those who don't pray taraweeh. And they say taraweeh is... A voluntary act of worship, true. If I don't pray it, I'm not sinful, true. And I prefer to watch TV, false. Yes, you don't have to pray taraweeh, and no one can make it obligatory after the Prophet ﷺ passed away having left it as a voluntary act of worship. In fact, what prevented him from praying taraweeh on nightly basis was that he was afraid that it would become obligatory upon the ummah. Of course, after he returned to Allah, alayhi salatu salam, there's no way that someone can make obligatory what he left voluntary. And therefore the Sahaba, Umar particularly, he reignited the sunnah of the Prophet, alayhi salam, of praying taraweeh or in congregation, praying the, uh, the qiyam in congregation. So it remains the sunnah until yawm al-qiyamah, in this sense. Some people don't even go. They busy themselves with something else. And wallahi, this is a major loss. Unless that person is praying at home his own qiyam, his own taraweeh, where he's praying his 8 or 11 rak'at or whatever, then jazaAllah khairan. Some of the ulama say, if you don't find in the masjid, if you don't find your heart in the masjid, if you don't find that you're, in, you know, you're interacting with the imam and you find better khushur at home, pray at home. It's okay to do so. But if this is not the case, if nothing is being done, then missing out on taraweeh is a major loss. The second group of people, or the second category, are those who pray taraweeh but don't pray isha. Right? And there's like a huge number of Muslims who don't pray the five daily prayers, but they only pray taraweeh. Some of them of course, they're more um, economic. They only pray in the last 10 nights. Some are even more economic. They only pray on Laylatul Qadr supposedly. Okay, it's just one time. It's like, a, you know, gambling. And you just want to get the jackpot. It's like the lottery. Hopefully, you know, the deen of Islam is a nice deen and I like it. So I just worship this God on this one night and I'm sure there's something big for me. Yes, sheikh. MashaAllah, tabarakallah, this excellent understanding of Islam is just outstanding. And we cannot really put it in words. This is not how we have a relationship with Allah. Surely, it is not about numbers, and it is not about, uh, you know, uh, an accountant trying to do his math. 
The way we deal with Allah Azza wa Jal is based on the condition of a helpless, hopeless slave with his master. However, the master is extremely generous, extremely merciful, extremely forgiving, and he promised you that if you are sincere, you will just get everything you want and more. So it doesn't get any better than this between one entity and another entity. Because in this worldly life, it's never like this. You, there's someone always trying to take advantage of your needs or, and, or of you being in the lower position. Only with Allah Azza wa Jal, you can be in the lower position and that lower position will raise you. That lower position will increase you. That lower position will get you closer to Allah. And it is not ironic that in the same ayat, which speak about this, Allah Azza wa Jal said when Allah started the ayah about Shahr Ramadan, then it says, وَإِذَا سَأَلَكَ عِبَادِي عَنِّي فَإِنِّي قَرِيبٍ أُجِيبُ دَعْوَةَ الدَّاعِ إِذَا دَعَانِ And when my slaves ask you concerning me, meaning when they ask the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, then Allah did not say to him, قُلْ Because we have very many occasions in the Quran where Allah said to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, قُلْ he said, فَإِنِّي قَرِيبٌ Allah automatically signified the closeness and the nearness by saying, I am near. He didn't even tell the Prophet ﷺ to say قُلْ which would have only added two letters in the ayah. The ayah could have said, linguistically, could have said, وَإِذَا سَأَلَكَ عِبَادِ عَنِّي فَقُلْ إِنِّي قَرِيبٌ This is grammatically, linguistically, and even from other examples in the Qur'an, totally fine and acceptable. But this قُلْ was removed. Because the ayah is speaking about how near Allah. So these two letters signify distance, even those two letters were removed to make it near. This is one of the miracles or one of the, uh, the miraculous nature of the speech of Allah in the Quran. So Allah Azza wa Jal is near. This is the type of relationship that we have. So how is it that we pray taraweeh and we don't pray the five daily prayers? That is quite amazing. How is it that we're keen on praying taraweeh and we're not keen on praying the five daily prayers? That's even more amazing. What is most important is the obligation and then we should be keen on praying taraweeh. So don't be of those who focus on taraweeh so much so that they forget Isha because Isha is more important than taraweeh. Thirdly, or the third category of people are those who go to taraweeh. However, they have no idea what's going on. No idea what's going on. And those are the people who always, always, always look for the masjid with the shortest salah and the quickest imam. And anything other than that just doesn't register well with them. So they find out, they do their own, you know, uh, uh, survey or uh, whatever, mapping huh? of the areas, they find out the masajid and the imams of masajid, the imams of these masajid, they find out that in masjid fulan, the imam only recites one ayah in each rak'ah, and they begin at exactly 10 or whatever, 8.25, they finish at 8, you know, 42. And then khalas. He camps there every night until the end of Ramadan and he feels good. He's standing behind the Imam, standing with everyone, you know, Allahu Akbar, Ruku and Sujood, and he has no idea what happened. Khalas. But he feels after he has left that I did my job and I hope, you know, uh, Allah will accept this from me and I'm, I'm good to go. Realistically speaking, this is also not an ideal approach. We say this person is better than someone who didn't bother to go, but is that what Taraweeh is supposed to be? Do we even know why it's called Taraweeh? has to do with the word Raha, Taraweeh from Raha. Because the Sahaba used to have to take rest, like a break between the Raka'at because of the duration, the length of the Salah. They would finish shortly before Fajr. Now we may not be able to live up to the way of the Sahaba in this regard. But ya akhi, don't be chasing after the short Salah. You should be chasing after the proper Imam. And what I mean by proper Imam is an Imam who follows the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu an Imam who recites with a melodious uh, delivery, who has a good voice, and most importantly one who interacts with the Qur'an. And that is the key right there. 
This is the job of the Imam. You find them, they're all over the place. Our job as Musalleen or Ma'mumeen behind the Imam is to prepare ourselves for this noble occasion. Either you speak Arabic, then you're halfway there, or you don't speak Arabic, then you have some extra homework to do. And usually these Imams follow, they go every day and read a particular part of the Qur'an. They go in some sort of sequence. And this is why it has always been said and reminded and recommended, Ya Akhwan, if you know that this Imam will be reciting Juz, you know, 15 today, then make sure that you read it at home. Read it in a language which you understand. Familiarize yourself with the content. So that when you hear the Imam reciting, you can feel that you're involved in the Salah. It is not about standing on your feet where you feel your cramps and your you know calves and your thighs starts to hurt and you start thinking about your knee. I think I should see a doctor for my knee. Every time I make ruku, my knee hurts and my ankle. The, the person gets preoccupied with his body now. How long have I been standing? I want to look at the watch. I cannot look at the watch. It's inappropriate to look at the watch. But this guy's been reciting for a long time. When will we finish Salah? All kinds of ideas come into the mind and the shayateen. Obviously, they're, you know, standing there, providing these thoughts on the spot. Hundreds of spots. Uh, of hundreds of spots. Hundreds of thoughts on the spot. Unless we're able to focus. How will you focus? The only way you can, you can avoid these whispers is if you are engaged with the Imam. Not engaged with the Imam as in an engagement. Now you're gonna say that I'm propagating some other stuff. Especially for the sisters, like, oh, okay, I'll go ask for his hand tonight. Then I can focus on the Salah. No, 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 I don't mean that engagement. Meaning you're engaged with the recitation of the Imam. There you go, that's a better way to put it. If you're engaged with what he's saying, if you're here in the speech of Allah, you won't be worried about your knee, or your thigh, or your calf, or your heel, or the time. You won't be worried about it. It's just, it will, you will not have time for it. And when it does come, because you are listening to the words of Allah, Kalamullah, you won't care anymore. This is what we're missing. This is what we are missing. And because we are missing this, we are distant from the Qur'an in general. And we find it okay to busy ourselves with other things which are way less important, if not unimportant, completely, during the month of Ramadan. It's because of our that gap. There's a huge gap between the Muslims and the speech of their Lord. And this is inexcusable. Seriously? I don't know how many times this has been said, but year after year, ya akhwan, and if we have still not learned Arabic as a major objective in the Muslim's life, this should be a goal which we all strive for. It is not mission impossible. It is not that complicated. Because people by nature can be bilingual, trilingual, and so on and so forth. It's, it's okay. You have learned other languages in your life. You probably speak two languages minimum. The most people speak two languages minimum. So what's the problem with adding a third? If that third one is that connection with the religion which you adhere to, and it is among the means for you to enter paradise. Come on! Why do we make it so complicated when it is not? Don't just say, I'm gonna go online and find a book and download this, you know, Medina book and then you do the first two, three chapters and it's all grammar, you don't understand what's going on. So you drop the whole project. That's because we didn't do the proper preparation before we embarked on this project. It is not about downloading a book and studying on your own. Sometimes it does it, very often it does not. It requires more than that. It requires an institute sometimes, a private tutor. It requires money. It requires dedication. It requires time. It requires sacrifice. But I'm telling you, inshallah, this will be the key. Yeah, and let's say you're 25 years old right now, 26, 30, 35, whatever your age is. Allah knows how many years you will still be alive. This will make a difference in the rest of your life. For the rest of your life, every Ramadan. If you don't believe me, ask anyone who understands Arabic and tell him, ask anyone who learned Arabic and tell him, how was your taraweeh before 
And how is it now? He will tell you the difference. He will tell you the difference. So this is something that I truly, truly, humbly uh, request. It's not even an advice anymore. It's a request to the Muslims. That we must learn the language which Allah chose to be the language of revelation. Which Allah chose to be the language that cannot be altered, it cannot be changed, it cannot be modified. The language of revelation as in the Quran. The Quran is preserved in the Arabic language. And so we have to put some effort in this regard. So if we go into the Taraweeh, whilst not knowing what the Imam is saying, then we will be the ones looking for the short Salah. If we know, this will not be an issue. Last, the last category of people are the people who go to the Salah and go to the Taraweeh and they understand exactly what is going on with the Imam. And those are the people that reap the most. And those are the people that benefit the most. And those are the people that we need to strive to become amongst. In the near future or in the far future. But it's something that we have to start working on from tonight. Until such time, until such time, then we need to read the meanings of these words in our own language so we can interact with the Imam in Salat al-Taraweeh. We can interact with the Imam in Salat al-Taraweeh because it makes a significant change in our understanding of the religion and our adherence to Islam. So which one of these are we? And what type of Taraweeh are we praying? And how much are we benefiting from these Salawat? A question which we can ask ourselves. Make sure that you don't miss out on the Ajr because of some television pro program. I remember I was in another country during the beginning of Ramadan, not in, not in Saudi Arabia, so no one will misunderstand me. And uh, it was the first night, I believe, I think the first night of Taraweeh coincided with the first game of the World Cup, correct? Who remembers? Oh, now you all forgot, huh? They're like, we're not going to give you the same answer twice. I think so. Wallah, if my memory serves me well. Anyways, I was with my relative, my, my brother-in-law, and I told him, uh, I said, this World Cup is a fitna. And he got mad a little bit. Like, why? Why you say it's a fitna? I said, it's just a fitna in the sense that the timing. The timing. It's coming at a very tough time. Ramadan... And it's just gonna be, you know, uh, the same timing of, of ibadah in many, in many locations and, and it's gonna be, not everyone will make the right choice. Unfortunately, not everyone will make the right choice. Many people will choose, uh, you know, FIFA over, uh, over taraweeh, over ibadah, over salah. He said, no, no. Because of the timing, it's fine. The game begins at 7 and uh, iftar at 8 o'clock. So people will finish the first game. Blah. He gave me the whole breakdown as to how the whole thing can be managed. I said, okay, Zakallah khair. Yani if you insist that the people can do both, alhamdulillah. You know, at the end of the day, soccer is not haram in and of itself. And you know, no one can say that it's haram to uh, play sports or to watch sports unless it contained something haram. Now, of course, they have some horrible cameramen in these uh, games who are always fetching for women, uh, you know, uh, among the audience every three seconds, BAM! They put a woman in front of them, hey, hey! You know, I thought we were watching a soccer game here, where did, she, where did she come from? So that's pretty annoying. Other than that, if the thighs are covered, uh, then it's all good. Make it even more difficult. But the point being, the first night, huh? The game, I think, went into overtime. And uh, in that country I was in, everybody's pro-Brazil. So we're in the masjid, praying, and outside we hear celebrations and firework and people honking the horns and everything. What's going on? Because, you know, whatever country had won uh, the game in overtime or penalty kicks or something. Anyways, almost every other day there was a game which wind up going up beyond the 90 minutes, so they went to overtime, and it actually had to override and conflict with the time of Salah. And the number of people in the masjid was significantly less than the night which didn't have a game, or when it wasn't very popular, you know, teams that were playing. So then it became a fitna. 
it became a fitna in the sense. So what do you choose? Now it's over, right? You can say, I'm going to fix it from now. Khalas, now the World Cup is over. Inshallah, tonight, uh, Taraweeh will be early in the masjid from now until the end of Ramadan. Alhamdulillah, he fat mat. Whatever happened in the past is gone. But seriously, it's an indication. It's an indication, which I'm talking about the hearts now. Okay, forget about, we cannot judge you, I cannot judge you, you can, no one can judge anyone. This is, in this sense, this belongs to Allah. But it's an indication for ourselves, for our heart. Your heart. Did it want to, or did it choose the house of Allah and ibadah? Or did it choose some sort of entertainment, which could be halal, even though it's halal, it shows that. So your heart was leaning towards that. It's an indication, it's a sign. And the intelligent one understands by the gesture. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam gave us three lessons which you all know. And all of them have to do with the forgiveness of sins. Man sama ramadan imanan wa ihtisaban ghufira lahu ma taqaddama min dhanbi Man qama ramadan imanan wa ihtisaban ghufira lahu ma taqaddama min dhanbi wa man Huh? Qama laylatul qadri imanan wa ihtisaban ghufira lahu ma taqaddama min dhanbi all of these narrations of Kamaqal alayhi sallam have to do with the previous sins being forgiven based on an act of worship which we perform in the month of Ramadan. Either fasting the whole month of Ramadan or praying at night the whole month of Ramadan or Laylatul Qadr. And the end result or the award that Allah Azza wa Jal will give the person is that his or her previous sins will be forgiven. Now, pause for a minute. I know we cannot look at our book of deeds, right? Each one of us has a kitab, uh, la, you know, that does not leave صغيرةً ولا كبيرةً إلا أحصاها That does not leave anything little or, or big, anything that we do except that it is enumerated and contained and mentioned and stated in this book. None of us has read his book. But we all know that we commit sins. Lots of sins. And so therefore, if we were to look at our book of deeds, can you imagine the accumulated number of sins which we have done since we reached puberty until now? So if you're 25 years old, that's around 10 years, more or less. And if you're 35 years old, that's around 20 years, more or less. And if you're 40, 45, 50, that's a lot of years of good deeds and sins. The good deeds, we don't know which of them were accepted, صح? No one knows that that particular deed was accepted by Allah. As for the sins, we know that the sins were counted if we did them intentionally. We weren't forced, or it wasn't by uh, mistake or out of forgetfulness. Those don't count. But the ones we willingly did, we intended to do them, we know we did them. Huh? How many? So there's a question mark about the good deeds, and a guarantee about the bad deeds. Accumulated over years, you're looking at bankruptcy. You're looking at disaster. You're looking at a catastrophe. And this is why the hadith promises these people that their previous sins will be forgiven and expiated. Because of how significant that is in the life of a Muslim. On Yawm Al-Qiyamah, the scale will be placed and the deeds will be weighed, good deeds and bad deeds. Whoever's good deeds, فَمَنْ ثَقُلَتْ مَوَازِينُهُ فَهُوَ فِي عِشَةٍ رَاضِيَةٍ This person will be having that life of satisfaction. وَمَنْ خَفَّتْ مَوَازِينُهُ فَأَمُّهُ هَوِيَةٍ And whoever's deeds are, his scales are low, they're light, then his, his head will be thrown into the hellfire. وَمَا أَدْرَاكَ مَا هِيَ نَارٌ حَامِيَةٍ We have other ayat in the Qur'an. So it's all going to boil down to these good deeds and bad deeds. We have been given an easy outlet and shortcut by Allah Azza wa Jal. Fast the month of Ramadan. Which Muslim on earth really believes in Allah and does not fast? Can you imagine even the worst among the Muslim ummah who hardly ever do anything in the month of Ramadan, they get some sort of revival to their iman. 
and you see them, you know, fasting, and some of them start praying, and some of them read the Quran. Alhamdulillah, khair. It's khair from Allah Azza wa Jal. Some, of course, after Ramadan ends, they go back to the old ways, and some continue to be to do good. It depends on the person and his relationship with Allah. But ultimately, ultimately, many people return to Allah in the month of Ramadan. It's a it's a time for that awakening of the soul by Allah's grace and mercy. So these bad deeds can be removed by fasting. And you fasting anyways. But what is the condition which you are missing? Imanan wahtisaban. There are two conditions that the Prophet ﷺ mentioned. You have to do so out of sincere faith and you have to do so seeking the ajr. Ihtisaban yani tahtasib ajr عند Allah. Muhtasiban you're sabiran. You are patient for the sake of Allah Azza wa Jal. What about if you're a traveler? Let's have a quick question here so you guys won't fall asleep soon. Huh? If you're traveling, are you allowed to break your fast? Or you become an evil Muslim? Who should be, you know, lashed a hundred times? One at a time, one at a time. You're allowed? Who's giving fatawa in the hall? Where's the mufti? You said it's allowed? What's your evidence? Who said it's allowed? It's okay, don't be scared now. Who said it's allowed and what's your evidence that it's allowed? Afwan? Quran? Where? Ayo? أيوة فمن كان مريضا أو على سفر فعدة من أيام أخر. so whosoever is ill or traveling then an equivalent number of days to be made after. زك الله خيرا. يا أخي بع some people والله they want to make things difficult in an area where Islam made it simple. one of them is the issue of illness and the issue of travel. a traveler and a person who is ill. They are allowed to break their fast. However, some of the scholars say, if you're traveling and you're able to maintain fast, then there's no harm in maintaining fast. If it's going to affect you negatively, it is haram for you to fast. The Prophet wasallam, when traveling once with the Sahaba, he saw a group of men around one man who was like fainting. He said, what is the matter with this man? They said, he is fasting. He said, it is not piety to fast while traveling. It is not a form of piety to fast while traveling. In other hadith, the Sahaba said, that when we would travel, لا ينكر المفتر على الصائم ولا الصائم على المفتر. The one who was fasting does not, does not really criticize the one who was, had broken his fast. And the one who had broken his fast did not criticize the one who was fasting. Meaning each one knows his own capabilities. If you're able to travel and it doesn't affect you and main, you can maintain fast, barakallahu feek. But if you cannot, then there's absolutely no harm in breaking one's fast. We're saying this so the people won't jump into conclusions and accuse Muslims of evil when Allah Azza wa Jal has lifted that. And Allah loves it that His concessions are given the same way He loves that the sins are avoided. So this is a rukhsa from Allah Azza wa Jal. If you're traveling, then you are excused from Fasting. Now, of course, uh, someone shared with me an amazing video of one of these uh, deviant denominations within Islam. They told him, Ya Sheikh, uh, you know, it's very hot in our region and fasting is long, you know, from this hour to that hour. So, can we break our fast? He told them, No, no, no. A'udhu Billah. How can you break your fast? I'll tell you what you can do. You just keep traveling. No problem, travel from one place to another, just keep traveling around, go to any place, any location. And as long as you're traveling, inshallah, nafi mushkila, you can continue to break your fast, and then you wait for the winter season, when the day is short, and then you can make them all up. Huh? So, yani, a travel of no purpose, huh? except to run away from fasting. That doesn't work now. Okay, that is the other extreme. Where someone says, you know what, it's too much of fast, let me just travel. 
I just go and hang out somewhere, you know, pay some money for these different flights, and not mushkila, I'll fast later. You cannot do that. The deen of Allah is not a joke. If you have a, a, a legitimate travel, then you are excused from fasting. So, fast in the month of Ramadan, غُفِرَ لَهُ مَا تَقَدَّمَ ذَنْبِ قِيَامِ مَنْ قَامَ رَمَضَانِ That qiyam includes the one you do with the imam in the masjid, or the one which you may do privately at home. It doesn't matter. The hadith says, مَنْ قَامَ رَمَضَانِ Whoever prays at night. A quick reminder, if you go to a masjid to pray with the imam, try not to leave before he does. Because of the hadith of Abu Dhar, which is sahih, that uh, whoever prays with the imam, حَتَّى يَنْصَرِفْ كُتِبَ لَهُ قِيَامُ لَيْلَةِ Whoever stays with the imam until the imam leaves, now the scholars differ. Does that mean he physically leaves the masjid? Or does that mean until he's done? The general opinion is that until he's done, then you will have the reward of praying all night. So you go after Isha, you pray Isha in the masjid. Then the imam prays 11 rak'at. Then you join him for the 11 rak'at, including witr. Then the imam is done, you have automatically received the ajr of praying all night. Even though you've only spent an hour, an hour and a half praying. So whatever you do afterwards becomes additional on top of the ajr which Allah Azza wa Jal would already give you of praying all night because you stayed with the imam. So some people are hasty and they leave before the imam finishes the last rak'ah or so on and so forth. They say, I want to pray with her later. If you really insist on that opinion and you're convinced that it is sound, okay. But the safer position is get that ajr by praying with the imam. Then if you want to pray additional rak'at, if you follow the position that you can increase and pray more than 11, which is fine according to the ulama who say that it's fine, then the ulama say you don't repeat with her. So you pray with the imam the 11, and if you want to pray at home another 10, 15, uh, 10, 15 or 10, 16 or 20 or whatever, then you may do so, but you don't repeat with her. But don't get stuck on a number. When you want to increase, don't get stuck on a number. There's no official number from the sunnah except 11. Another hadith from Ibn Abbas, 13, because that included the sunnah after Isha. These are the only official numbers from the sunnah. From other sources and other narrations, which many are uh, authentic, uh, inauthentic, I'm sorry, then you have 20 and other numbers and so on and so forth. But don't get stuck on a number that I have to pray this many rak'at. If you like to increase, now the ulama say, go ahead, pray more than 11. But don't make it a particular number that you limit yourself to. You can pray 15 or 13 or 17 or 19 or 21 or 23, but don't be stuck with numbers that are not from the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And the last one is, whoever prays or whoever stands in prayer, Laylatul Qadr. Again, ya akhwan, we cannot uh, emphasize enough the importance of Laylatul Qadr. It is recommended that you don't overeat on that particular night because the main enemy uh, that we have nowadays is eating. As soon as your stomach has been resting, like right now, all day, your stomach is on vacation, technically speaking, it's not really doing much, unless it's still digesting the monster which you ate last night, mashallah, tabarakallah. In which case, may Allah protect your stomach and, and help, help it in the, this very difficult task which it has. But generally speaking, the stomachs are, you know, relaxing. Then all of a sudden you start shoving all this food as soon as you know they say Allahu Akbar uh, from the uh, ma'zana. And then uh, needless to say, your stomach now is being uh, over occupied with all types of food for however long you wind up eating. Uh, what happens is because of that sudden intake of food, you uh, you're physically become fatigued. I, I know you've experienced this. You become tired and you become sleepy. Yeah? Many people drink some shy afterwards and khalas. They call it a day until the next day. Huh? They wake up after Fajr, the next day there's nothing else to be done because the food was you know, overwhelming. Uh, but the truth of the matter is we cannot, you have to be able to control yourself. We have to control ourselves at the time of breaking the fast because it will affect the remaining uh, of the night, the remaining time of that night. It will affect it 100%. So the last thing you want to do is ruin Laylatul Qadr because of 
the yummiest sambusa that they, you know, put on the table. You know, the whole Ramadan, you've been waiting for the right sambusa and every night it was tasting horrible. Then on Laylatul Qadr, mashallah, they did it right. So he said, khalas, I'll eat only 15 of those to make up for the 15 days that pass or whatever and I'll be good to go. La ya sheikh. Control yourself. Sambusa, you know, it's a nice cute little thing, you know, triangular and pyramid shapes and all kinds of stuff and round and circles, but that thing is just like a bunch of oil, you know, at the end of the day, and it's really too much for the stomach. So as much as we like sambusa, uh, not everything that you like is good. And sambusa seem to be the one like a, a extra uh, cross-cultural uh, meal or, or uh, what you would call it, appetizer. You know, in the Middle East, this is the most common appetizer as well. In the Gulf, it's the most common appetizer. I guess in, in the subcontinent as well. You know, everywhere I go, any place I've been to the world, they always have sambusa somehow. It's like, where's this sambusa man chasing me even in this cuisine? There's also sambusa. Chinese cuisine have sambusa. Everybody has sambusa. So it's this global meal. Or global food. But it's, you know, it could be very damaging to your uh, salah. And to your taraweeh. And to your fasting as well. So, you know, be careful of the sambusa. This is the message for this Ramadan, right? So, have a campaign uh, against sambusa. Put sambusa with a big X on it, put it all over the streets. No for sambusa, and person's like, sambusa. It's like committing a crime. But realistically speaking, uh, so we're back to the uh, normal mode. Back to the normal mode. So, uh, the, the month of Ramadan, we're, we're almost done. Seriously, we're almost done. We're at the, at the end. A quick advice to myself and you. Your smartphone sometimes is not that smart. Or maybe the phone is smart, but we're not. If we're misusing it. So let's give our phones a, a vacation. Unless you're reading it, unless you're using it for the Quran itself, meaning you prefer to read from the uh, phone or the tablet versus the mushaf, jazakallah khair, and no harm in that, no problem in that. Sometimes it's easier with the bookmarks and stuff like that, no problem. You can hear the recitals, you can see the tafsir. This modern technology can be very useful, in all honesty, more so than the traditional. But if we're not, then the first advice is, cut down on your phone. Unless it is something important, take it easy. And you all know yourselves, I know myself, this is a big, it's my job. Okay? So I mean, it, I have to try to balance, but it's a very difficult thing to do. However, I'm reminding myself and you to minimize the phone usage unless it is among the means to get us closer to Allah Azza wa Jal. Television, in all honesty, if you can afford it, I don't know about your budget and your wealth, but if you can afford it, with a scissor, just chop that cable and keep that television off. Now, yes, you may want to follow the news. Uh, Palestine is of concern. The Muslims in Syria is of concern. There are Islamic programs on TV which are beneficial. I'm not trying to uh, paint everything with one brush. You understand what I'm saying? I was referring to the evil aspects in the TV. TV that does not stop broadcasting women. It does not stop broadcasting music. It does not stop broadcasting vice and evil. This is the type of TV that I was referring to. If we are engaged in that kind of TV, forget it for, for, for the rest of your life if you can. If you can't, at least for, for the rest of Ramadan. Maybe Allah will guide our hearts to be able to overcome this TV for the rest of our lives. Unless we will have a TV that we will use in a manner which is pleasing to Allah, in which case your head should be kissed and you should be congratulated and a special award should be given to you. But those people are very, very few who truly utilize the television. So phones, slow down. Television, khali wali as they say in, in back, back home, you know. Let it go. Forget about it. Thirdly, the Quran. Back to the Qur'an, don't forget the Qur'an, read it, understand it, interact with it, reflect upon it. When you read an ayah that has 
mercy, ask Allah Azza wa Jalla. It's, it's from the Sunnah of the Prophet Alayhi Sallam. When you're reading the Quran, he would do this in Salah, let alone when reciting from the book. Yeah, and you read an ayah and then it says, you know, إِنَّ لِلْمُتَّقِينَ مَثَازَ حَدَائِقَ وَأَعْنَابَ وَكَوَاعِبَ أَتْرَابَ إِلَىٰ أَخْرِهِ مِنَ الْآيَاتِ Right? Take your time, stop, and ask Allah to give you that. I mean, the, Allah is describing what He has prepared for the muttaqin. I mean, this is the time to, you don't have to say, Wallahi, I, if I don't finish uh, the juz, I will not do the khatma, and if I don't do the khatma, people get stuck with these numbers. They get stuck with the khatma, I have to do a khatma, two khatma, three khatma, they become preoccupied with how many times they finish the Quran, and the whole time they're reading like a machine. Just going through it fast, 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 fast. What is the benefit? Is that really why Allah revealed the Qur'an so we can just skim through it and finish it quickly and say, Wallahi, I finished the Qur'an twice in Ramadan? Absolutely not. The objective behind it is to, to benefit from the message. So when there are ayat of the, of Jannah, paradise, ask Allah for Jannah. When there are ayat describing the good, the righteous people, and we know we're not, you know, we're not like them. We see them. When you read the Qur'an, you're amazed at the description of the muttaqeen. In Surah, Al, uh, in Surah Al-Nisa, you find them. In Surah Al- what is the Surah I wanted to mention? Not Surah Al-Rahman. Al-Furqan. You know, the end of Surah Al-Quran. Or Surah, uh, Surah Al-Nur. Any of these Surah which describe the believers, uh, or the, you read them and you say, wow, Allah, these are some, some awesome people. These are some great people. Ask Allah to make us among them. Because we know how far behind we are when it comes to those righteous people, Surah Al-Mu'minun as well. So we have to realize that the message of the Qur'an is not, it is not a, 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 a right in the sense that the people just do on yearly basis like ritual. It is not ritualism. It is not ritualism. It is a real, vibrant message that we Muslims have to understand. If we understand it correctly, then we can benefit from Ramadan inshallah. So choose. That's why the title was Parallel Ramadan. We have the Ramadan which Allah Azza wa Jal has decreed for the Ummah, full of ibadah, full of, uh, you know, uh, charitable uh, act- actions, full of remembrance of Allah, full of recitation of the Quran, and the Parallel Ramadan which we have, television series, playing games on our phones, and overeating. These are the two lines, two Ramadans. One is legit, and one is devilish and fake. Which one are we going to choose? What, what type of Ramadan are we going to have? Not next year, now. If we have been on the wrong path, shift. You're still in Ramadan, shift. Shift from that bad one to the good one. It is easy. It is easy, and we ask Allah to make it easy for us. So this is the uh, conclusion of the lecture inshallah and we can open the discussion now for questions and answers. Jazakumullah khairan for listening attentively even though you're tired and I, I understand that you're tired. Hada wallahu alam wa sallallahu wa sallam ala nabiyyina Muhammad. Assalamu alaikum. So okay, there's, uh, there's mics coming around. You just want to put your hand up and the, the, the launch you can bring a mic to you. Uh, we have questions from the sister's side. Okay, while we're waiting, uh, I'll take a question from the brothers, please. Yes, sir. Uh, is it okay to pray uh, Tarawih as well as Qiyamul Layl in congregation? Aywa. Yeah, that's, uh, that's a tough question because I've honestly come across different opinions of the scholars and I myself, as a regular Muslim, I have not found my heart in either opinion. Meaning at times I, I just lean towards the opinion that one should restrict himself to, to the 11 rak'at and should not pray more. That's one reason. The other reason is that the Sahaba did not divide the uh, taraweeh in this fashion where they would pray and then go home and then come back and have qiyam as we do today. Uh, then later on, we, I read the opinions of the other scholars and the, the general uh, you know, understanding of the textual evidences that there's a lot of flexibility in this regard and that it is a time of khayr and any ibadah is good uh, and it's not necessarily in disagreement with the sunnah. So really there are two opinions, both of them are strong and I'm not in a position to give you a preponderant 
position. So I say, ask a, a sheikh, and then whatever he tells you, act upon it. But, uh, they also do this in the haram. What did I, no, see, that's uh, whatever happens in haram, akhi, is done by human beings. 1400 years after the Prophet wasallam, And that is by no means an approval uh, or uh, an evidence that this is the sunnah of the Prophet wasallam. And we can, we can enumerate many things and that is not our objective to find fault. But we can enumerate many things that happen in the haramain, uh, meaning al-haram al-madani and al-haram al-makki that are against the sunnah, not by the people in charge, but by the Muslims themselves. And the fact that they do it does not make it correct. Because the people that are doing things are regular, regular human beings. Even though they may be in a position of, of a, like a scholarly position, like the mu'adhin or something like that, may do something that is contrary to the sunnah, it does not mean that everyone uh, is approving of that or that it is allowed or from the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. So the fact that it happens in the haramain does not change anything. We can say simply, as I told you, because there are two opinions, they are entitled to follow the opinion that it's okay to do this. So we're not saying that they're going against the sunnah and the haramain, because I didn't tell you it's a bid'ah, and then you tell me, well, they're doing it in the haramain, so now we say, aha, so they're doing bid'ah. I already told you, both are being done. I, I personally lean towards both positions every now and then. So, I mean, jazamullah khair, whoever's doing it, we ask Allah to accept from them. You know, there's, 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 this is a gray area, really. Now. We're also uh, taking questions from the live stream uh, audience, so if you have a question, just uh, type it up in the chat box and we'll, uh, we'll try to ask them as we go along. Okay, uh, is there a question on the sister's side? Alaikum uh, salam. Well, I mean, of course, the ruling is that it's halal. You know, it's allowed. No one, because all of these are voluntary acts of worship. What we're saying is, uh, you don't want to miss out on that which is more important. Yani, when the people of Musa, uh, Allah was giving them al-man was salwa which is among the finest of food. They said, we want onions, and we want beans, and we want... He said, adna huwa khair. Do you choose that which is lower, less important, less significant, less rewarding than that which is better? So, I mean, it's halal to eat onions, and, and beans, and lentils, and stuff like that. But you don't choose that when you have al-man wa salwa, which are types of food that, you know, the Bani Israel was, was you know, Allah Azza wa Jal was given Bani Israel in a very easy manner. So, yeah, I mean, you can have a party, uh, p- party in a sense, iftar, party, and bring the people to your, your party and so on and so forth. Uh, not that you're gonna, you know, do something else along with it. Not the other type of parties if you're a teenager. Uh, and, and totally fine, but if that's going to lead to wasting the whole day cooking, and then wasting the whole night cleaning, and then everybody misses out on the ibadat, then that defeats the objective. Of course, there's a room in Islam for the socializing, keeping the kinship ties. Alhamdulillah, yani you can utilize these events and bring the family over here. We're not saying you, everyone's going to become totally you know, uh, independent from the rest of the family. But they should be uh, managed well. I think if you have an iftar party, you can manage it well enough to make sure that it does not affect the other ibadat which are expected to be done. Not that they are obligatory, but at least you don't want to miss out on them. So have an iftar, say for example, uh, you can send an invitation, you're most welcome and you know, we love to have you here. The exact timing of the event will be from whatever, you know, 7, 15 until half an hour before Isha. We apologize ahead of time, but you know, we have some obligations, blah, 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 whatever the reason may be. Khalas! The people come already have, having, you know, understood your reasons, and they act accordingly, inshallah. If someone stays after, just kick them out. Okay, uh, any questions from your brothers? Anyone? Okay, go ahead. Salam. Alaikum salam, ma fi sheikh. Uh, hey, uh, I just want to ask about the Hebrew pattern for the last few days. How is that uh, supposed to 
being taken undertaken by us, especially you. You mean at night? Uh, whatever sleeping pattern, whether at night or day, afternoon. I mean, what? What? Look, the the Sunnah is that the Prophet ﷺ would mix the first ten nights of Ramadan, the first twenty nights of Ramadan. He would mix between sleep and and uh, night prayer. When the last ten nights would enter, then that would stop. He would remain up the whole night. So it is recommended, recommended that we also remain up the whole night in the last ten nights, specifically Laylatul Qadr. Uh, which might fall on the 21st, 23rd, 25th, 27th, 29th, or it may fall on the 22nd, 24th, 26th, and 28th. You may say, how is that? Well, Shaykh al-Sahib ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah had a very interesting observation. Because some of the hadith speak about the day and the night, and it depends on how you're counting, it can actually fall in any one of the last 10 nights, believe it or not. It's a very strong position of Shaykh al-Sahib ibn Taymiyyah. You can Google it if you like, and see how the Shaykh deduced from the many narrations that Laylatul Qadr can be in any of the last 10 nights, depending on how you count. Because some of the hadith say, li sab'a baqiya, li khamsa baqiya, meaning if there are seven nights remaining, five nights remaining, three nights remaining, and some of them count this way. So counting this way and counting that way, you will actually wind up going over the last 10 nights. So stay up the whole night, pray Fajr, and then sleep till what? I mean, what would be reasonable, I would say, is 10.30, 11 max unless you have to go to work obviously huh? you don't go to work tomorrow say wallah the speaker they brought from Jeddah said I can come late to work I know we start at 10 o'clock but he said 11.30 so uh, here I am no, it's none of my business if you have a job <clears throat> Allah ma'ak as they say but if you don't then yeah I think 10.30 11 o'clock is reasonable and then if it depends now on you on you you as a person, we're not the same. Some people, mashallah, tabarakallah, they're able, they have endurance, they're able to fast, and it does not affect them, and other people, they fall apart. Some people must sleep again, at least for half an hour, otherwise they can't function. Some people don't need to sleep. You cannot give one answer for everybody. But what we don't, what we want to agree on is that we don't want to abuse huh, the hours of fasting by sleeping. To, to the extent that we don't really fast, we're just like sleeping the whole time. How each person understands best, you know, where he should, or sh where he or she should be. Now, Another question from the sisters. No, you're only allowed to hold the mushaf in taraweeh if you're the imam. Because Aisha radiallahu anha used to have a slave boy who would lead them in salah and he would read from the mushaf. And therefore the scholars understood from this particular evidence that that is the only time it is allowed for someone to carry a mushaf while praying. It's for the imam leading the ma'mumin. As for you praying on your own, there's no evidence that you may do so. And as for the ma'moon behind the imam, that's the worst thing a human being can do in a salah. I just don't understand how in the world someone will stand behind the imam and read the Qur'an. My go read it at home, ya akhi. He's reading for you. Are you going to tell me you know exactly the length of his ghunna and his idgham? And he, you know, when he will forget a word or forget it, are you able to read with him 100%? It's impossible. Human, human, humanly impossible for you to be with the Imam, the same mind, the same tongue, the same rhythm, the same impossible. Therefore, he's reading and you're reading. What is going on here? You pray, you're in a salah. This is only the recitation. The recitation on its own is a problem because you're either behind him or you're after him. And then worse than that, is that you want to flip pages in the salah. Ya Sheikh, yani, how is that? Flip the page, put it under the armpit, put it in the pocket, in the sujood, they don't know how to put it. The whole time, ya akhi, you're distracting the human beings, ya amma, let us pray. If you want love the mushaf so much, go in the corner over there and we will all be happy for you. Let the rest of the people pray in salah. The one who stands with the mushaf, he ruins the salah for the whole row. Because all they see is someone moving and going, and you hear pages flipping and all this. It, yani, it's, it's one of these strange uh, habits which we have picked up from, I don't know which religion, but I don't, I'm sure it is not from Islam, maybe from the Jews or something. 
They do this in their religion, but you should never ever do this in a salah. If you're behind the imam, then you, they say, Ya Akhi, he doesn't know, he's not a hafid really, yani he may make mistakes. So I'm reading with him, in case he makes a mistake, then I will correct him. Now you're less qualified than him already. If, if you need the mushaf to correct him when he makes a mistake, then what is your job? If you don't have it memorized, then why are you the shaykh now to correct the shaykh? Ma leave the shaykh alone. And if the shaykh made a mistake, then life goes on. If the for imam forgot the ayah, all he has to do is say, Allahu Akbar, we're good. And then after the salah is done, he can open his mushaf and see where the mistake he made is and go back. And I mean, it's, the deen is very simple. So please don't be among those spoilers who spoil their salah. And according to many ulama, the salah is invalid. All this movement that you're making, the salah is invalid. Don't spoil your salah and the salah of others by standing behind the imam and reading along with, along with the book from your own mushaf. It is not the time. You're there to listen. إِذَا قُرِئَ Quran. You listen attentively, you pay attention to what the Imam is saying. This cannot happen when you're reading simultaneously. Try to read and listen at the same time. If I'm reading a book right now and you're talking to me, how in the world am I going to do this? I can't. Either I'm focusing on what my eyes are seeing, or I'm focusing on what you're telling me. You cannot multitask like this. No. It's a question from the live stream audience. If the Aisha Jama was inadvertently missed, and the imam is praying tarawih, what does one do? The, a person joins the imam with the intention of praying Isha, and when the imam gives the taslim for this, and the second rak'ah, you get up and you continue your third and fourth rak'ah. Unless you're a traveler, in which case you finish with the imam, because you're only, you're only praying two rak'at. Go ahead. I have a question here. Uh, the Imam Ali Ali that is called the whole time and uh, then I realized that I have to eat something so Adam finished and I still like keep eating and then I finish and then go for Salah so is my fast for being counted or not? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, you know, we have, well we have a number of issues the first issue is that um, the time of Fajr is at the moment Assuming the Mu'adhin is following the proper sighting and, and, uh, uh, of the Shuruq and or the Buzuq Shams, then the moment he says Allahu Akbar, that's when the time actually ended. Not the duration of the Mu'adhin, because you have some Mu'adhinin like myself who finish the Adhan in, in 30 seconds. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Ashadu an la ilaha illa Allah, Ashadu an la ilaha illa Allah, and some, mashallah, tabarakallah's adhan is 20 minutes, with the stretching, and up and down, so what, the whole time he's going to adhan, mashallah, we're having a meal, enjoy your shaykh, come, he just started, don't worry, inshallah, we still have another 5 minutes, I know the mu'adhan is awesome, so you go choose that channel, particularly so the adhan will take 15 minutes, and we're having a big suhoor, mabi siri akhi, from the time he said Allahu Akbar, that it was over, so the fact that you started eating after he already went halfway through the adhan, that's just one issue. Let's assume that in a better situation, that you were eating and then you heard the adhan be given, then we have strong evidences from the sunnah, is that you may continue what you have in your hand. And that does not include a plate, which you suddenly pick up. Huh? Right there brother. So, I'll finish this until... No. The hadith says if you have something in your hand, then don't put it down until you have eaten it. Usually you have a date or you know, something like that. Not, not the whole plate as we know today. So in this case, yes. You may, while the mu'adhan is calling the adhan, meaning the time has entered, you finish what you have in your hand. And your uh, uh, fasting would be valid. But in your case particularly, you, you did something else. Now whether you are excused for not knowing or not, then you need a fatwa. But uh, from a technical point of view, that fasting is invalid. But would you be excused for not knowing? Allahu Akbar. If, uh, if women pray Taraweeh at home, would it be the same reward as praying behind the Imam all night? Maybe uh, more. Actually, according to the hadith, her ajr will be more. The prayer of the woman at home is superior to her prayer in the masjid. The, uh, what we, however, she's allowed to go to the masjid. The only thing which uh, we have to consider here 
is that for the sisters, she also, like the man, has to look for where she finds her heart. Meaning, if the sister knows that when she goes to the masjid and prays behind this imam, she enjoys the salah and she, and she feels khushur and she, her heart softens and so on and so forth, then some of the ulama say, in that case, it is better for her to, uh, better for her to go to the masjid instead of praying at home, provided that she goes out with modesty and she's dressed appropriately and she's not a source of fitna and they put all the other conditions, no perfume, so on and so forth. If she has met all of these conditions and she feels an increase of iman in the masjid, then she should go to the masjid and pray with the imam. However, if she doesn't feel that, then it's better for her to pray at home. Or if she wants, if she feels better in the masjid, but she goes out and becomes a fitna for the men, because unfortunately, some sisters, for whatever reason, yani they go and, and they stand in front of the, the women's section, and they're dressed with some sort of adornment, and the brothers are walking by, and it just becomes like this really weird situation with all kinds of, you know, glances and looks back and forth, and, well, you know, I'm assuming good, but still, weird stuff happen. So if that sister is going to become a fitna for the men, then she's better off remaining at home. If she knows how to carry herself, uh, in an Islamic manner, as she is, uh, as she ought to, and then, and she feels that the iman will increase, then go ahead and go to the masjid, inshallah. We'll take a question from the sister's side. Alaikum salam. Yes, of course, because finishing the Quran is not, it's not the goal. Yani the ultimate goal of the Qur'an is Hidayah. Sah? ذَلِكَ الْكِتَابُ لَا رَيْبَ فِيهِ هُدًا لِلْمُتَّقِينَ Now let me ask you, if you read the Qur'an, if you did 20 khatma, 20, you are the shaykh of Islam, of our modern days, and you finish the Qur'an 20 times, is that going to guide you? Really? No. You got ajr. But is that going to guide your heart to Allah Azza wa Jal? No. If you read one ayah, one ayah of the book of Allah, لِيَوْمٍ عَظِيمٍ الْعَالَمِينَ You read in Surah Al-Mutaffifin, it's a very small surah, not even that. Surah Al-Zalzala. فَمَنْ يَعْمَلْ مِثْقَالَ ذَرَّةٍ خَيْرًا يَرَهُ أو مَنْ يَعْمَلْ مِثْقَالَ ذَرَّةٍ شَرًّا يَرَهُ Whoever does the deed, a deed equivalent of an ant or a grain, he will see it on Yawm Al-Qiyamah. An evil deed of that small, you will see it on Yawm Al-Qiyamah. And you stood in this one ayah and you said, La ilaha illallah, what am I doing to myself? Why am I doing this to myself? How am I going to meet Allah with this? I have all the sins. And this ayah made you repent and return to Allah. Which one is better? The second one is better. One ayah that you benefit from is superior to finishing the Qur'an 20 times. Our Salaf, our righteous predecessors, they already knew the Qur'an. For them reading it once, twice, three times had a special effect and value. In our case, if we're battling uh, between uh, understanding the message and merely reading it, then surely without a doubt, reading it is not important. Or not as important as understanding. So I would say even if you finish only Surah Al-Baqarah, but you have understood Surah Al-Baqarah and the message of Surah Al-Baqarah and the value of Surah Al-Baqarah and it has affected your Iman, this is better than finishing the Qur'an 100 times in Ramadan, no doubt. Because, كِتَابٌ أَنزَلْنَاهُ إِلَيْكَ مُبَارَكٌ لِيَدَّبَّرُوا آيَاتِي وَلِيَتَذَكَّرَ أُولُوا الْأَلْبَابِ A book, this is the Qur'an that we want to read. It told us already, a book we have sent down upon you, O Muhammad Wasallam, blessed, Li, Lam, yani for, in order for them, li yadabbaru ayati. So they may reflect on its ayat. They may contemplate and ponder its ayat. Wali yatadakkar ulul albab. And those who have some brain will take a reminder from the Quran. Reading it ten times will not remind you about anything if you don't understand what you're reading. If you don't understand what you're reading. Reading one ayah with the tafsir will do the job of reminding you. So, it's a very simple equation. But the problem is we either, either don't trust the promises of Allah enough or we are too much affected with our culture. It's difficult to defeat our culture. Oh, if someone asks me how much if you finish the Quran, oh, only two Jews, they're gonna look down upon me and say, what? 
Everybody, I've done three khatmah and you only did two juzu and we worry about the people and we don't worry about ourselves. So in order, in, so in case someone asks, I can tell him, ah, oh, Shaykh, this is the third one. Huh? Don't worry. In order to feel good in front of the people, we miss out on the true message of the Quran. It doesn't work this way. It shouldn't be this way. Now, don't worry about the culture. Don't worry about the people. Don't worry about the khatma. Worry about understanding the speech of Allah. One ayah is better than, than a thousand that are read with no understanding. Clear? When a, uh, a woman is on her period, is she allowed to use the Qur'an or recite the Qur'an using her phone? Yeah, I mean, there's a difference of opinion among the scholars and a very strong opinion says that yes, she may do so provided that she does not touch the actual mushaf. If she's using a smartphone or a tablet or whatever, uh, then many of the ulama say that it is allowed even if she is on her menstruation because there's no clear-cut evidence that uh, uh, prevents her from reciting the Qur'an. No clear-cut evidence on this issue. There are, you know, different uh, uh, hadith and ayat of the Qur'an which have multiple interpretations. Some of the scholars understood them and they did qiyas on Janaba and so on and so forth to say that she cannot. This is not like the major impurity of Janaba. So for the menstruation in particular, there's nothing that suggests that she may not do so. She may do so, inshallah. Now. On the brother's side. Hello. Wa alaikum salam. Rasulullah used to ask for uh, Jannah uh, when he was reciting the Quran, when the verses of the Jannah was coming, he was asking for Jannah, and when the verses of the Hamza would come, he would seek refuge from it. I want to know if we are allowed to do it, uh, especially in the first Salah, when the Imam is, especially in, in the congregation. When the Imam is leading the Salah and we are coming across these verses, are we allowed to uh, ask or seek refuge uh, in this situation? If the Imam does, then you do. If the Imam doesn't, then you don't. Because you, the Imam is made to be followed. So if he is um, aware of that sunnah, and we hope that they are aware of that sunnah, and he stops at this ayah and he asks Allah, then you may ask Allah as well. If he continues reciting, then you have to continue paying attention to the recitation and you may not take that time to make your own personal dua. Then when you go for sujood, then you can ask Allah Azza wa Jal for that. No, but you follow the Imam. No. Question from the sister side. I'm sorry? Now, the ulama say the time was equivalent to reciting 50 ayahs. The sahaba mentioned that the time between suhoor and fajr was equivalent to the recitation of 50 ayahs. Now, uh, this does not mean that we go by this imsakiyah, you know, the, the, the timetable for salah in Ramadan, which has a special column called imsak. And that imsak is like 15 minutes before Fajr. This is a bid'ah. And this is a dalala. And this is dhulm to the Muslimin. Because Allah Azza wa Jal said, فَكُلُوا وَشْرَبُوا حَتَّى يَتَبَيَّنَ لَكُمُ الْخَيْطُ الْأَبْيَضُ مِنَ الْخَيْطِ الْأَسْوَدِ مِنَ الْفَجْرِ uh, Allah allowed us to continue to eat and drink until خلص, Fajr becomes evident. So who's going to come and tell you, no, you stop 15 minutes before that. So the sunnah is that you, a few minutes before Fajr, a couple of minutes, which is equivalent to reciting 50 ayat, you stop, and like we said, however, you may continue until uh, the time, but don't take that risk every day. So the sunnah is 50, equivalent to reciting 50 medium ayat from the Quran. That is the sunnah time between suhoor and the entrance of Fajr. Now, I broke my fast uh, early. Lahi <laughs> It's a question. Ah, okay. Question. I didn't break my fast. Exactly. You made me freak out. I love you for your concern. I broke my fast at an earlier time, uh, that, or at a time earlier than the Adhan by mistake. However, I continued my fast until the actual Adhan. Was my fast is validated? Do I need to repeat it? No. But I'm, I'm curious about that mistake. Like, what is by mistake? I mean, we understand if it's by mistake. It doesn't affect. If you did it out of mistake or out of forgetfulness, it does not affect the validity. But I don't, I'm hoping it's not a mistake that it could have been avoided. 
or a mistake out of negligence and heedlessness that caused to do you know make a mistake of this sort. Uh, so if it, you know, be careful of what type of mistake, so that you can avoid it in the future. Because some people find a nice, a convenient mistake that they do every other day. Like some people make dua, oh Allah, please make me forget that I'm fasting, so I may eat a couple of bites and then remember afterwards so that my fasting remains valid. Khalas ya amma, just keep fasting and it's almost there, you know? So be careful of these mistakes, huh? Okay, uh, question from the world. It is that uh, it is ideal for women to pray at home. So are they allowed to pray in congregation? And how about men like in case you are not able to go to Muslim? Yeah, I mean, as we said, women may and uh, may pray in a congregation. It is totally allowed. The Prophet ﷺ said, "La tamna'u ima Allahi masajid." Allah don't prevent the women folk from the houses of Allah. A woman may pray in the masjid as long as she meets the conditions of modesty and and shyness and so on and so forth. Um, for the men, then of course they are expected to pray in the masjid. Are you with me, brother? Who the women? Yeah, of course, of course, they can have one female imam with no men behind her. Emphasize and underline that one, because some people have gone to mashallah to a, a new extreme, female leading salah with men and women behind her and everything. It's an amazing event. They recite the translation as well. They recite in Arabic and then... Yeah, yeah, in English. Yeah, it's, it's modern, modern technology, man. We're just behind, subhanAllah. Okay, a uh, question from the sisters, please. Uh, that depends from a child to another. I mean, generally around maybe five, six years old, you can start having them fast part of the day to see how how well they can take it and then obviously when they become I'm, I'm speaking about my experience with my children and you know relatives and, and stuff like that uh, they're able to ha like for example my son Muad he's uh, almost five years old and this guy is, is, is a lunatic like his father he decided to fast on his own one day and he fasted the whole day and we were in a country where fasting, I think, was like maybe 16 or 17 hours. And no matter what, we try tell him, yeah, Sheikh, uh, calm down and eat the sandwich and then continue fasting, you know. We're trying to uh, negotiate with him. He insisted, Zallah khair, to fast uh, on that day. And he, he managed. Now, I'm shocked at his, as his father because he's all tiny, petite, you know, you think he will disappear in a couple of seconds. Uh, but he managed to do it. And uh, his siblings and other relatives at the age of seven, eight, they were fasting every day, the whole day. Uh, some kids cannot take it. They cannot take it. They have to be at the age of 10. So, I mean, really, it depends. I think from five onwards, you can start testing the child. Don't starve him to death. Okay, because they're not expected to fast in reality until they reach puberty. So don't kill a child and then say, well, Allah, the, the speaker was suggesting that we train them at a very young age. The Sahaba used to train their children from a very young age. And the evidence for that is that when they would start crying, the kids would start crying, they would give them duma, they would give them like a doll. You know, but not, not, it wasn't Barbie back then, alhamdulillah. It was something a little bit more uh, modest and old-fashioned. They would give them these dolls from ihn, from some sort of wool, and they would play with them to preoccupy them until time of iftar. So the fact that they were, you know, uh, at what age does a child start complaining and you give him a... Uh, a doll to play with for them to be quiet quite young because nowadays an older kid you give him says get out of here man what is this I'm not gonna play with this and I need to eat right now I'm telling you or you know give me something that you know at least will busy me let me drive the car and maybe then I can fast until Maghrib but uh, for them to accept a doll and be happy with it they must have been young so that's the evidence that they used to train them at a young age. But that's only training. Huh? It's not obligatory. Uh, just a two-part question here. Uh, if the Imam prays Shafa and Witr like Maghrib Salah, is this correct? And why do some people pray, uh, some people get up after the Imam give the Tasleem and Witr to continue another Raka? Yeah. Well, the, the, the Maghrib and, and Witr should not be identical. 
Uh, so the Salat al-Witr should not be prayed the same way we pray Maghrib by praying two rak'ah then sitting for tashahud and standing for the third rak'ah. Even though some of the masajid, the imams do it, uh, they do it because they believe it's correct. We assume so, but it is incorrect and it's contrary to the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. Uh, the second question was, why do people get up after the rak'ah with the imam, the witr rak'ah? Because they want to pray some more, and the imam will only pray one rak'ah, so they can plead two, in order to not have prayed witr yet, because they intend of praying witr later on in the night. Now, and I believe Sheikh bin Baz allowed that. We have a question from the brother's side, uh, I think the young man over here had a question. Yeah, hand up, I think he's a bit busy now. Okay. Assalamualaikum. Alaikum salam. Have we used that food paste during the fast? Yes and no. Yes, you can, but there are two things I have to bring to your attention. First, your breath will still stink because the problem is not with the toothbrush and the toothpaste. The mouth, uh, the smell or the odor comes from the empty stomach. The empty stomach. Because one has not eaten, uh, for example, just before Fajr, brush your teeth. And then three hours later or four hours later, speak to a brother. And as soon as you speak to his nose, he will turn around. Ask him why. He'll tell you, brother, honey, you're fasting, I can smell it. But I brushed my teeth. It's not in your teeth. So the issue comes from the stomach. The empty stomach is what emanates this foul uh, smell, which is to Allah more, uh, you know, more uh, uh, beautiful than the smell of musk. But uh, for us human beings, it is not. And therefore, yes, you can brush your teeth, but then again, why? Are you trying to avoid the bad smell? It's not going to happen. Secondly, make sure if you want to follow the position that you may brush your teeth, that's why I told you yes and no, make sure that you don't swallow anything. And that's sometimes difficult to manage or control. So you're really taking a risk by brushing your teeth. And I personally would recommend to wait until you break your fast. And then you can break your fast after eating a day by brushing your teeth. And then, you know, do whatever you want to do. But avoid it as much as possible. Agreed. So the, now, you, so when they, when you speak and you smile, you don't want them to see that you know sesame seed that is stuck between your teeth. If that, wait a second, I'm not, I'm, I'm serious. If that is the case, I understand what you're saying. If you're still talking to me about smell, with in the office, I'm telling you, brushing your teeth is not going to get rid of the smell. It will always smell bad. But if you, the real solution is, once you have suhoor, brush your teeth. And that way, when you go to the office, your teeth are already clean, because you haven't eaten anything. Obviously, you didn't have breakfast, I hope. And then, khalas, you've uh, accomplished your goal. Brushing your teeth again, a second, third, fourth time, until iftar, will not eliminate the foul smell. If you don't trust me, or you don't believe me, try it. Don't try it on me though. But can you substitute with the miswak? Yeah, you can. The miswak, make sure it's not flavored miswak. The natural. Yes, sir, you can. Any number of times do you need it? Yeah, all day, Yashir. Oh. Barakallah feek. Hello, oh, Musa, can you, uh, can you repeat the sister's questions after they're asked? Yes, sir. For the online audience? So yes, we'll sir. We'll take another question from the sisters. So the sister was asking about uh, some of the imams after they conclude the recitation of Surah Al-Fatiha, they pause for some time before they begin reciting the Surah. So the sister was asking, do we use this time to recite Surah Al-Fatiha? Actually, the first thing that I would like to say is that it is contrary to the Sunnah to leave this gap. Uh, the Prophet ﷺ would leave two gaps in his Salah. One upon Takbir, in order to say Dua al-Istiftah. As soon as you say Allahu Akbar, he would say different ad'iyah, 
before the initiation of al tawwuz followed by al basmala followed by al fatiha and he would leave another gap after he has concluded reciting the surah which comes after the fatiha meaning after he says other surah let's say surah al fil tarmim bi hijarati misjid faj'alahum ka'asf ma'kul then he would pause alayhi salatu wasalam then he will do takbir to go to ruku' it is not narrated that he ever left a gap or a time frame between the fatiha and the surah which some imams do today they give you time to recite the fatiha it is contrary to the sunnah however you cannot control what the imam does you may pray behind an imam who does so in which case yes you may recite the fatiha some of the scholars like Sheikh bin Baz rahimahullah and others they were of the opinion that you can recite the fatiha anytime specifically and only the fatiha you can recite it before the imam with the imam after the imam as long as you recite it in each rak'ah how it is done is irrelevant because it is uh, you know it's part of salah that you cannot afford to leave otherwise your salah would be invalidated but if the imam is not following the sunnah and leaving this gap then you may use this time to recite the fatiha but my only concern would be is that really enough time is that maghrib already and some people, you know, make their watch come, you know, sooner so they can, like that mistake. That's why I was worried about the brother with the mistake. Hmm? Oh, by mistake, yeah, I put the alarm one hour early. I need to install new application for Salah time. Uh, so what was I saying? Aywa. Yeah, would you really have enough time to read Fatiha in the short span of time? I mean, how are you going to recite the Fatiha? Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, Rahman, Rahim, Malik, Amdiyah, Kana, Abdiyah, Kana, Sahin. That type of recitation, that, that doesn't count. That is not Fatiha. That is just someone who's trying to get rid of something. Fatiha is a, is a speech, it's a conversation with Allah, wherein you get a reply after each ayah. As we know in the authentic hadith, and if you want more on this topic, the lecture on One Way to Paradise is titled One Way to Paradise. So on the YouTube channel One Way to Paradise, there's a lecture called One Way to Paradise, which is about Fatiha. Where when you say Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen, Allah says, Hamidani Abdi. My slave has praised me. When you say Ar Rahman Ar Rahim, Allah says, Athna alayya Abdi. Every time you recite an ayah of the Fatiha, Allah responds to you. So if you're going to just read it all fast so you can finish it, what type of response will you get? And where is your involvement with what you say? You're praising Allah, you're magnifying Him, you're exalting Him. Then later on, you're telling Him you worship Him alone. Then later you're asking Him to guide you to the straight path, the path of those whom He's pleased with, not the Jews, nor the Christians. Where is Where are all these meanings? If we're going to use that very short period that the Imam leaves between the Fatiha and the Surah to squeeze in the Fatiha. I personally think it defeats the objective of the Fatiha. Therefore, it is better for you to recite it along with the Imam or even before or after, provided that you read each Fatiha, each Ayah properly and you pause at the end of it and you, you know, uh, believe that Allah Azza wa Jal responds to you as He promised in the Hadith. Now, um, The questioner asks, should autistic and other special needs children fast? Uh, fast? If they are exempted, what would be the uh, compensation if there is any? No, this is for the doctors to, to you know, judge, I, I don't know. The judge, will, the judge, the doctor will tell you whether this particular child's illness, regardless of what it is, uh, I don't have a medical background to know, whether this illness is one uh, which, wherein he can fast, he can, uh, he can uh, handle it or he cannot handle it. Uh, but either way, let's assume that the doctor says, no, this child has this such and such disease and he cannot fast. A child, you don't have to do anything for them because they're not expected to fast. So there's no compensation as in the case with the one who has reached puberty and has some sort of disease, either chronic illness or something that is temporarily, that person then can either make up the fast or pay a fidya. For each day, he does not fast. But for the child, until they reach the age of puberty, there's nothing on them. If they can't fast, khalas. No problem. The doctor says that, then it's fine. A question from the brother's side. We have two. Both are wearing blue. This is a question regarding the sort of compassion and asking something more of the second class and social basis. Yes, sir. Uh, 
what if one is not able to complete the Fatiha and Imam moves to Ruku? You should be also doing the same, right? Yes, you may you say Takbir and you follow the Imam. Ala So I still get my Raka even though I have not completed my Fatiha. Yes, sir. Because that was what was within your ability. And what is expected of you is to recite the Fatiha as Allah commanded, وَرَتِّي لِلْقُرْآنَ تَرْتِيلًا Not مَشْيَ حَالَكْ So yeah, some will say, Akhi, but if I'm going to recite it the way you're saying, then by the time I say, Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim, the Imam is making ruku' Say, ذَنْبُ عَلَى جَنْبُ This is his own issue. This is how fast he recited the Fatiha. It doesn't concern you. You have done your job of reciting the Fatiha as you are expected as per the Sunnah. And of course, you have uh, multiple evidences from the Sunnah that the Prophet ﷺ will elongate the ayat in Fatiha and he will pause at the end of each uh, ayah. This, this is from the Sunnah and you follow in the Sunnah. So if you don't manage to read except one ayah and he goes for ruku, you go with ruku with him, there's nothing on you, inshallah. Now. Question for the sisters. Well, there's a difference of opinion among the scholars. Um, I, I suggest that you refer to the fatawa and uh, read because they they all have their point of view and they have their they trace it back to the Sahaba. Uh, but the general condition is that no, if if a woman is unable to fast due to pregnancy or nursing then she simply has to make it up afterwards. And she does not have to pay any fidya. Some say if she pays a fidya, then the hadha hasan, this is good, and it's safer, and so on and so forth. Some say she must do it. But the general opinion is that she does not have to do anything except make up the fast. But she shouldn't let it go to, yani miss, the next Ramadan comes, and she still hasn't made up those days. Then she goes into the danger zone, where the scholars say now she must pay fidya. Now. Asks, what is the best deed after the obligatory acts in the month of Ramadan? Uh, the best, the qiyam, uh, afdal salah, yani afdal salah, uh, baad al farida, uh, salatul layl, uh, the best prayer after the obligatory prayer is the night prayer. Now, and that has its own value and virtue. Then the Quran obviously is not obligatory to read the whole thing or to read a particular number of surah or uh, uh, pages per day. That's also among the active worship. I would say I cannot really tell you which one is the best. All of them have their own virtue and you try to, you know, manage to, to benefit from and get a little bit of each. Now, Question from the brothers? Actually, but before that, both of them rose, uh, raised their hand, and then the brother was not yet in the picture. Then, in that second time, he got involved. So, in reality, it should be either that gentleman here or the brother there. My name is Mr. Turban. Assalamualaikum. Waalaikum salam. I have a question regarding the last five nights. Um, the people who don't have the, they don't uh, memorize the Quran a lot of. So, how they can do, like, can they listen to some lectures during the night and uh, have the short salah? Because they cannot have long qiyam online for themselves by themselves. They cannot read? For example, if, if I am, I cannot have the long qiyam then if I'm doing individual. But, but fine, but can that person sit down and read the Quran? Or listen to the lectures? Fine, listen to it. Oh, it's a given, it's fine. Uh, dhikr in general is fine, uh, you know, reciting the Quran, oh, I'm sorry, not uh, listening to a lecture is fine, reading a book, an Islamic book obviously, uh, is, is fine. All of these, even a non-Islamic book at the end, they, that would also be fine. But what I'm saying is, okay, I understand the person who cannot pray Qiyam for a long time. But another important deed would be reciting the Quran. Is that person unable to also recite the Quran from a Mus'haf? Well, you can read the Quran by sitting, but I'm saying like Qiyam is actually meant like you're, uh, you're doing the uh, nawafil tonight or something like this. Or does that mean like you wake up and you keep on reading the Quran? Or you cannot possibly keep on reading the Quran, you know, unless, unless that person, mashallah, has some amazing ability to read for hours continuously. 
Uh, the truth of the matter is you're supposed to utilize the time in a manner which is pleasing to Allah. That includes dua. That includes dhikr. That includes reading. That includes listening. I mean anything which will put you in that in the ibadah zone. Because that time is multiplied. The ajr is multiplied during that time. Uh, but w- what I'm afraid is that because we might become lazy, we might become lazy, say, Wallahi, let me listen to six hours of lecturing, inshallah. And alhamdulillah, I was busy you know, with ibadah. We say we have missed out on a more important ibadah while doing something good. So we just have to manage it properly. Yes, listening to a lecture will do the job. But yani, that should not be the only thing we do. But to hear that, like, uh, people who don't understand the uh, Quran, like, they have a choice either to read the tafsir or to listen to the tafsir of the Quran from some scholar. Why don't they read it on their own? Reading is better than listening. If they read the tafsir of Ibn Kathir, and it's available in English, it's available online, it's available everywhere, it's better than hearing someone else tell you about it. Absolutely, absolutely. Then being a mere listener because you're engaging your eyes and you're thinking and you know your physical movement, the time, other than you know uh, playing some speaker in the background, you know while you're doing you know cooking your sambusa, right? Make the sambusa while the sheikh explains the tafsir for me, which is good for the sisters, by the way. As an alternative, because she cannot possibly make the sambusa and read the tafsir of Kathir at the same time. But for the brother, no sambusa to make, I hope, unless the roles have switched in the house, then he could uh, avoid the listening and do the reading on his own. Zakallah khair. Pass the mic to the gentleman next to you, please, who had raised his hand. Zakallah khair. Uh, I'd like to ask two questions, if I might. Yes, sir. In the beginning, you mentioned something about how. Okay, the reason why I said that is because there's a very popular narration that the khutaba and the, the speakers often quote and it's a weak hadith that the uh, ajr of the uh, farida in Ramadan, uh, the ajr of the nafila in Ramadan, the voluntary act will have the reward of an obligatory act and then the obligatory is multiplied by 70. That is what I hear in so many places all the time. And because of that particular hadith, I was saying that there's no evidence about such multiplication. Otherwise, it's a virtuous time. So needless to say, yes, the, there's a lot of evidences that Allah Azza wa will give ajr. But to say multiplied by 60, 70 times, then yeah, that hadith is weak. No. Okay, so the second question, if I may. Yes, sir. Is, um, it's not in, in the, since you spoke about sin, um, I have had an understanding for a long time that when one is tempted to commit a sin, one should fear Allah and try to resist. If one has committed a sin, one should hope for Allah's mercy and not be afraid of punishment. This is the understanding I had for a long time. Okay. Now, what I want to understand is I I heard somebody say something recently from the from other. I don't remember exactly what he said, but he was indicating that one should have fear. When one has committed a sin, one should make trouble with fear and regret. So I would just like you to enlighten on whether my understanding was correct that after one has committed a sin, does one just hope for the mercy of Allah or should there be some element of khawf from Allah at that time? Ultimately, there should be khawf from Allah Azza wa Jal and there should be remorse. And this is based on the Quranic ayah. وَالَّذِينَ إِذَا فَعَلُوا فَحِشَةً أَوْ ظَلَمُوا أَنفُسَهُمْ ذَكَرُوا اللَّهَ فَاسْتَغْفَرُوا لِذُنُوبِهِمْ وَمَنْ يَغْفِرُوا الذُّنُوبَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ وَلَمْ يُصِرُوا عَلَى مَا فَعَلُوا وَهُمْ يَعْلَمُونَ Allah described the condition of the muttaqeen and he said and those who when they, uh, they commit an ab- abhorrent act of, of evil or they wrong themselves they remember Allah they remember Allah and therefore they seek forgiveness for their sin and they don't insist on what they're doing while they know <clears throat> this among other hadith and ayat from the Quran have to do with the, uh, the idea of remorse, remorsefulness or uh, the feeling of guilt. And the ulama have won to the extent that they made it one of the conditions of tawbah. Meaning tawbah is not valid unless you feel remorseful, you feel that you've done something bad. And it's a normal thing even with kids. 
When you deal with a kid who was maybe misbehaving and you don't feel that they feel bad for what they have done, you, you think something is wrong. So you don't even feel bad. You should be feeling bad that you hit this other kid, for example. So it's a logical thing that we have this uh, feeling of guilt. But that shouldn't, as you mentioned, shouldn't lead to the point of despair and, and uh, you know, self-destruction. Oh my God, I've done this. Allah will never forgive me. That's the other extreme. So yes, there has to be this type of uh, guilt uh, that leads to asking for forgiveness, that leads to Allah Azza and we believe that Allah will forgive and accept. Now, we hope. Take uh, one more question and this is the last question from the sister's side, inshallah. Is it okay to have a meal with a non-Muslim, uh, friends and family? Well, uh, for the uh, non-Muslims, uh, we would uh, hope that it's for da'wah purposes because of the hadith that none should eat your food except a pious person. So once there's a da'wah niyyah somewhere there, you're trying to bring them to Islam, show them the beauty of Islam, the generosity of the Muslim, something like that. You know what I mean? You, you have some, and a, a part of your intention has to do with delivering the message of Islam to them in an effective manner. In which case, inshallah, it's, it's okay. But if it's other than that, if it's means of magnifying them or, or uh, you know, things that will conflict with our uh, understanding of, of uh, allegiance and, and declaring innocence, then that may be a problem. Uh, and the same goes for, you know, the whole bringing people over and, and you know, ta'am and nas is, is something that is virtuous in Islam and feeding the people is virtuous in Islam. So inshallah ta'ala, this is something that iftar al-sa'im specifically has its own traditions that are authentic about feeding a fasting person that you will get the ajr of that person uh, but you know be careful when you invite people make sure that you have planned uh, properly what you know the, the event and make sure that your niyyah uh, is to bring them uh, you know bring them closer to Islam and bring Islam to them in a, in a professional I guess uh, effective way not not something else no. Uh, okay, so I've been told that there's a, a new Muslim who has a real quick question in the audience, so we'll just take that, and that'll be the last one. But also, can I intercede for the gentleman here who raised his hands many times and was ignored? Okay, so I guess that's uh, two questions. Uh, question is quick, uh, regarding the cut. We had a habit of doing the catering of the cut during Ramadan and then trying to distribute it before we do. Is that a practice or we can do it during the whole course of the year? Yeah, well that is a malpractice. Uh, if, if it entails wronging the people. What I mean by that is that your zakah, zakatul mal, may be due in Muharram, may be due in Rajab, may be due in Rabi'u al-Thani. And then the person says, Wallahi, Ramadan is a special time, so yalla, we'll take a year and a half to pay zakah. But the money is due to the poor people, or the seven categories of people entitled for zakah, a few months ago. So on what basis is someone while waiting conveniently for Ramadan? There's absolutely no basis. If you happen to start stashing your cash in the month of Ramadan, and that's how it should be done, not in February or March or April, we should go by the lunar calendar. So uh, the Nisab, I don't know about the Nisab, it could be 5,000 dirhams, okay? So in Ramadan, is the first time you had 5,000 dirhams on the side that you're not using. This is savings. And you make money in every month, you add 2,000, 1,000. The next Ramadan, they become 20,000. Then that is the perfect time for you to pay the zakah. Because it started in Ramadan. But if you started collecting the money in Muharram, you, you cannot pay it in Ramadan. You understand what I'm saying? And then, now, now we have, we take everything so easy, mashallah, including this one. Allah, Ramadan is good time. Everything, zakat al-futr, zakat al-mal, any type of zakat, ya shaykh, yallah. It's one month, we do everything, and then 11 months, we rest. Until that one month comes again. It's a very strange mentality. But the rights of the people, akhi, belong when they, when they are due. And that is 12 months from the time you have uh, collected the first, started the savings. Now, you're welcome, sir. Is it compulsory for a, for a Muslim to complete a five time prayer every day in compulsory? Yes, sir. Yes, one of the uh, after you establish your belief in the ultimate uh, uh, Creator, Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, 
the next most important thing in your relationship with him on, on that level of creation and creator is salah. There are important things like uh, dutifulness to the parents and you know things pertaining to the society, but those have to do with other creatures. On a level of creature, creator, the most important thing after believing in him properly is establishing the prayer. Because that is your connection. So uh, you can imagine your life uh, with low connection or no connection. Like a person right now with Wi-Fi, and that Wi-Fi router is very lousy, and it, it cuts off every you know couple of minutes. A person with 4G, and a person with no data. At the same time, all of them are trying to access their email accounts. One, the Wi-Fi will keep, you know, the hovering or buffering and whatever for the thing to load and it doesn't load. The one with no data is like, hey, any hotspot over here? No one gives him any attention, right? It happens to someone I know all the time. And then when he travels abroad, and then the one with 4G, ala tool, he presses the, the Gmail thing and psh, the emails pop in his face. So who's the most connected one? The one with the fastest connection, the 4G. It's faster than Wi-Fi, by the way. So I'm, I'm just giving you something you can relate to. Similarly, now we're all Muslims. The one with the best, most consistent in five daily prayers is the one with the fastest and best connection. And when you're connected well, you don't get disconnected. So if you have a weak connection, you may eventually lose connection. So what happens is the devil will tell you, you don't have to five times a day, that's a lot. Especially morning prayer, come on, people are sleeping. You're gonna wake up at four in the morning to pray to God. God is easy going, God is nice, God is loving. You can always wake up at nine and pray then. No. No, we cannot make God what we want God to be. God is what He is and He told us how things have to be done. He made the sunrise, before the sunrise, a time for establishing prayer. So, you know, you, you fight the devils, and you maintain these five daily prayers every day of your life, even if you're in the hospital, and you're lying down on the bed, and you can't move your joints, because of whatever reason, you pray with your face or your eyes, by merely moving your eyes. The, the Muslims used to be involved in warfare, back at the time of the Prophet, the disbelievers were fighting the Muslims, trying to kill them, and they would establish prayer on the battlefield. You would think this is an ideal time to pray later. Nope. Nope. So this salah is, the prayer is very important. And it is the most significant connection you have with the Creator. The better you perform it, the more guarantees you have to enter paradise. The worse performance, the more chances a person will miss out on the path to paradise. So the, the one thing you don't play with, period, is prayer. Five times a day, from now until you pass away. It's easy, don't worry. We've been doing it for many years, alhamdulillah. It's not like you're gonna carry a mountain every time you pray. You get used to it, it's beautiful.